Welcome back to the second in our series of lectures about the kinematics of plate tectonics, now talking about convergent plate boundaries. Uh, the previous lecture was about divergent plate boundaries where they were moving apart. Here we're going to talk about plates that are moving together. And um, I mentioned the last lecture would be relatively short, and I don't think it was particularly short. Hopefully this one is. It should be. We have again only one goal in this lecture, and that is to present the essential features of a convergent plate boundary, which again is one of the three types of plate boundaries that we're going to be looking at. Here we have a diagram from the Turcotte and Schubert geodynamics textbook of a cross-sectional view of a convergent plate boundary, a subduction zone, and you're probably already quite familiar with um, diagram like this. The sense of motion here is convergent, the reason for that being that the plate on the right side here is basically stationary in this picture, and we have oceanic lithosphere moving in from left to right, and that results in relative convergence, of course, between the two plates. The subduction zone itself is a place where we're destroying the oceanic lithosphere. Again, this makes sense with the map that we saw in the previous lecture about the age of the oceanic lithosphere being relatively young compared to the age of the Earth, not much older than uh, about 200 million years old for the oldest oceanic seafloor. And so here's the place where we're clearly doing some recycling. The geometry of the picture here, um, you know, subduction zones can vary a bit, but in general we've got one plate that's going down being pushed beneath another, and um, we may or may not have a pile of sediment that's being scraped off that downgoing plate that's forming an accretionary prism um, along the margin of the other plate. It's In many cases, we'll have some kind of volcanic activity, um, but it may or may not be there, as well as the presence of a back arc or marginal basin. Um, they form in different places um, as a result of variations in the regional structure of the geology. So depending on the geometry of the downgoing plate or various other features, you may or may not have uh, a marginal basin. A question that we can kind of motivate our thinking about these convergent um, plate boundaries is why is it that this plate subducts? And so what I'm going to do again is just pause the video here, uh, or give you a chance rather to pause the video to think about that for just a moment. Why is it that we have subduction of this oceanic plate? Well, I hope, um, now that you've had a moment to think about this, that perhaps you've come up with something similar to this. We know that as the oceanic lithosphere moves away from a spreading center, it's going to cool down and it's going to contract. And when it contracts, the density of the material is going to increase. The density of the lithosphere is going to get higher. And eventually the density of the lithosphere will get high enough that it's actually more dense than the underlying asthenosphere. And so there's a subtle point that I want to make here, um, and that is that we're talking about this density difference um, as the whole oceanic lithosphere being denser than the asthenosphere. The oceanic crust, of course, is going to be less dense than most of the lithosphere, and of course less dense than the asthenosphere as well. But we'll eventually reach a point with old oceanic lithosphere that it cools down so much that it becomes more dense than the asthenosphere upon which it's resting. This of course results in the gravitational instability. We have denser material sitting atop weaker material, and the asthenosphere is capable of flowing over geological timescales, so that oceanic plate is going to want to sink down into the underlying asthenosphere. And as it sinks, the motion of the plate is going to be driven in part um, by the end of the plate and this FSP down here, the slab pull force of this plate dragging the rest of the plate down um, into the subduction zone or dragging the plate along here horizontally and then down into the subduction zone. So this is another one of our plate driving forces um, that we'll talk about in later lectures. Here we have just uh, 
diagram of the, the kind of generalized geometry of various subduction zones across the world. Uh, this is again from the Turcotte and Schubert book, and you know, all of these little abbreviations are different um, subduction zones, and so you can kind of um, take a look at the textbook if you're curious about which is which. But what we can see, even just from looking at this, is that the subduction angle, as indicated here by the geometry of these kind of bending plates, is about 45 degrees on average. Um, some variation, obviously there's some that are steeper and some that are shallower, but 45 degrees is kind of a typical angle. Question for you, and again, I'll give you a chance to think about it for a moment by pausing the video, is if gravity is driving the subduction process, why are slabs subducting at about 45 degrees and not closer to 90 degrees? Why aren't these slabs sinking straight down toward the center of the Earth? So again, pause the video, think about that for a moment, and uh, we'll come back to that question. Okay, so, uh, yeah, why are we seeing slabs that are subducting at an angle of less than 90 degrees. Well, there's not exactly a clear answer to that question, but some of the thoughts are that these subduction zones, we have a plate, of course, that's sinking into another fluid, sinking into the asthenosphere, and it's going to interact with the asthenosphere. And there's two different kinds of variations on how this might happen that are illustrated here in another diagram of, again, very schematic subduction zone. And so in one case, we have here on the left side a sort of cartoon version of a plate coming in horizontally and then going down at 45 degrees. And the arrows that are shown above that are induced flow in the mantle. So this is a flow in the mantle that results from this plate sinking down. So as it sinks down, it drags along the mantle and drags along that mantle and makes it flow. Now, this can explain potentially why we might have back arc spreading and why also uh, we might get uh, volcanic activity as a result of corner flow, you know, relatively warm material flowing into that corner of the plate. But it also suggests there's an interaction between the plate and the mantle that might result in the coupling and sort of support for this plate that's sinking down, such that it doesn't sink at a steep 90 degree angle. On the right side there, the, the slab rollback model is another idea, of course, um, this is something that applies in some places, or seems to apply quite nicely in some places. And part of this is that the, in addition to the slab kind of coming in horizontally and sinking down, in places the slab might simply be foundering and kind of falling um, down into the mantle as shown by the vectors on this plate. So it's sort of itself, instead of just coming and going down like that, falling down and laying down into the mantle. And of course, as that would happen, you're not then sinking at 90 degrees with the plate dipping, but maybe the plate itself as a whole is kind of falling closer down or closer toward vertical into the center or toward the center of the earth. And so again, here's another model that can also explain things like back arc spreading as we have sinking slab here and more warm material that's going to flow in. Um, now, regardless, this is sort of an enigma because we have here a convergent plate boundary with a zone of extension that forms in it. All right, so that's it for our lecture about the convergent plate boundaries. Again, you've got another quiz, so please take a few minutes to do your quiz and then move on to the next lecture about transform boundaries and the Wilson cycle.